Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. In this program, we discuss a range of issues. The platform for this program is the Center for Security, Strategy and Policy Research. CESPA is a policy research center housed in the University of Lahore and researches contemporary security and strategic issues. This program is part of that effort and we aim to speak with national and international scholars and policy experts on a broad range of issues. And these are the issues that have a bearing on Pakistan. So stay with me and I'll be back shortly. Welcome back to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. Today's program is a little different. Pakistan's first ever national security strategy talks about a citizen-centric approach, i.e. the citizens' rights must inform the core of any state's national security. The reason is simple. If the citizens are happy and content, the state is secure both internally and externally. The compact between state and society is grounded in constitutionalism, not coercion. Of the many rights, two are crucial, education and health. In a world, economic strength is underpinned by the creation not just of wealth, but also knowledge. One can hardly overemphasize the need for an educated and healthy society. Today, I shall take up education. What does it mean? How can we develop a thinking and critical society? How can education impart knowledge? And what is or should be the dynamic between the two? To this end, I have with me Musharraf Ali Farooqi. Farooqi is an author, translator, and an international authority on Urdu classical literature. His novel, Between Clay and Dust, was a finalist for the 2012 Man Asian Literary Prize. He is the founding editor of the Library of Urdu Classics, which is urduclassics.com. Faruqi has extensive experience of developing and publishing children's literature in Urdu, gamification of pedagogical tools, and Urdu language reference works. He is the founding editor of the online Urdu Thesaurus. It's uh, urduthesaurus.com and the inventor of the Hijay game, Hijay.com. He's also the founder and CEO of StoryKit, a program to teach Urdu language through stories and storytelling, which was adapted by UNESCO and successfully used for a Google Foundation training to over 25,000 children and over 1,000 young women across Pakistan. Faruqi is a Harvard University South Asia Institute Fellow and has served on the Executive Committee of the Board of Governors of the Archaeology and Literary Heritage Foundation Fund. The fund is managed by the Ministry of Information, Broadcasting, National History and Literary Heritage. Musharraf also has a website which is micromath.com and he tweets at micromath. So it's great to have you on the program Musharraf. Uh, you know, <laughs> we've been talking about this for a while and finally uh, we, we are here. So I just want to, you know, storytelling is something very interesting. I mean, I was just uh, going through something of AJP Taylor, you know, used to call himself a narrative historian. And he famously said that the first function of the historian was to answer the child's question, what happened next? And we also have a lot of literature on why storytelling is so important how the collective cognition creates culture and how that culture ultimately becomes history. So let's start with your personal experience of how you started doing this and then we'll proceed from there. Uh, thank you, Joss, for having me. Um, and thank you for uh, bringing up this subject of uh, collective cognition, which is, I think, central to any kind of communication and uh, growth um, of human society. So uh, re regarding myself, uh, I started um, as a child in a sort of kind of slow city of Hyderabad, where the only entertainment were um, either reading books in the afternoon or, uh, you know, just going hunting for lizards and stuff like that, or wrestling with my younger brother after watching the World Wildlife Federation uh, programs. So those were the kind of entertainments we had as children. And I'm very thankful that we were not uh, hammered by the kind of continuous testing that today's kids are subjected to, which allowed us to explore um, what, uh, 
what we what entertained us and find things and you know the down the downtime which is so important for kids just to sit still um process things that have happened um imagine things and you know just be idle and not do anything which which is a virtuous thing trust me uh, as a child uh, so this is how i started um i never thought that i would become a writer but i knew that there was there would be some a connection to writing and books i could have been a librarian i could have been a printer i could have been a bookseller it could have been any of those things um i i was uh, i dropped out of engineering i was studying at the nid uh, i had left electrical engineering program i um, joined journalism uh, i was part of the launch team for the news and uh, another newspaper in karachi financial times um financial post i'm sorry uh, that came out also a, a weekly magazine politics and business at one time and uh, then myself and my wife michelle we left for uh, toronto um and for 15 years i was there um working on my novels working on my translations doing odd jobs uh, to support myself and uh, that has been the trajectory of uh, that's been a uh, that's been a great journey and i i'm so happy you talked about downtime and and you know uh, the fact that when you're idle you're not really idle because you know going back to my own childhood and i also belong to the pre digital uh, and almost uh, pre television generation in the sense that even though television was here uh we uh, were not really allowed to watch it so we kind of early you would go out uh i started reading these imaginary tales i remember you know the dastane uh, amir hamza and tlisme hoshroba for children and that kind of uh you know created a a different kind of world and uh, i think that imagination is is extremely important uh and both at the individual level and then you know as i said and as you mentioned uh, about collective cognition so you doing a lot of work uh with reference to children i talked about in my opening the hijje game uh and you know uh, various other sort of gamification and story kit for uh, pedagogical purposes so give us a sense of why you think that's important and how did you I mean, I think it's because of your engineering background that you you managed to somehow work out these these uh, you know very elegant uh, but uh, you know very interesting creation. So um, I think uh, when I started, um, it started with a publishing house, uh, Kitab, and Story Kit, which is also a publishing house, but also a storytelling service and program came later. But the um, the story uh, kit program evolved um in response to a failure in book sales um we would go to uh, schools introduce them to books and there would be no interest and no sales so the whole thing changed when i said i'm going to recite narrate not recite but narrate the stories from these books and see how kids respond to that and they loved it i even though i write in english uh, i always do storytelling in urdu and the kind of connection that kids have uh, even kids who do not study in urdu medium schools and even kids who do not find it a uh, very uh, prestigious to speak in uh, urdu they love the storytelling session and they, they they went to explore the book so the whole program evolved because of that and it it became more and more refined as i saw its potential to help ch- children communicate um i have trained uh public representatives as part of the ali filan program um i did this leading through teaching workshop for pakistan parliamentarians at one time so i formalized that program and uh, they loved it they went to their own constituencies did storytelling there but in in response to this a um, need for storytelling the program evolved and we included more things to it we we started with the story kit which is uh, a small book 
which fits into your pocket um, in a box, three by four inch box with a game customized to the story and a QR code through which you can listen to the narration of the story. So that uh, product has been very, very successful. It was tested by UNESCO in a pilot in Muzaffargar. Uh, the response was huge and uh, also recently by Google Foundation in the Internet Safety and Media Literacy Program. And this, um, I, I believe that storytelling and children's ability to tell stories and communicate with each other, which is part of our program, is fundamental to bridging this, um, this gap, which formal education, uh, we are being told by policymakers, is not going to fill. And they are saying that we cannot train enough teachers to deliver education of a certain level to students. So we'll have to rely on ad tech. Mm. And I do not believe in that. I believe that, first of all, if you are serious about your kids' education, which is, the, I think, should be the most important priority of any people, um, then you should not say that this is not possible. You have to make it possible or you know, step aside and make room for somebody else who can think creatively to make it possible. And the second thing is that education technology is not going to fill the gap. It is just a tool to deliver. Um, but how do you create engagement with education between education and kids? That engagement has to come through a process of educational storytelling, through a process of educate, uh, storytelling for fun, and through a process where kids are able to narrate stories to each other, which um, have all been field tested and have uh, yielded wonderful results. Right. So it seems to me that from what you're saying, uh, that the the oral part of it. Uh, appeals to the children more perhaps at the, at the initial level than the written part of it. Now, we'll, we'll get to the written part of it, but give me your sense of is this, I mean, we know historically uh, that uh, the oral tradition was uh, very important, uh, what we call Dastan Goi. And, you know, people would, uh, one of the reasons these stories kind of expanded because the reconnoiter would sort of add uh, other things to it and all of it was imagination at one level also perhaps uh, uh, you know people's desire to be lifted above and away from the the reality of their existence so all of it i think there's there's a there's a mix back there so give me your sense of why it's important to focus on this oral tradition and to sort of, you know, uh, make efforts to further advance it. Um, it just is because when we receive something uh, orally first uh, as, as an audience, by list, just by listening to it as, as individuals or as groups, um, the first barrier of comprehension is crossed. Because if, if I'm narrating a story in a classroom and everyone is listening to me, uh, they are receiving a story. Uh, and if they have any, um, if there are any difficult points in the story, I'm either able to explain to them or they can ask, you know, this does not make sense to us, kindly explain what this is. So the first barrier of, uh, to comprehension of a narrative is, is crossed. Then these kids, to relive that experience of that fun experience of listening to that story, when they pick up that book, they already know the characters, they already know the plot, they already know the sequence of events. All they have to struggle with at that point are some new words, maybe, or words which were un unfamiliar to them in, in, in written format. So the challenge at the, at, the, at the second stage is a very small one compared to uh, providing the kid with a child with a book and asking them to engage it, engage with it on the page with that written text first. Mm -hmm. So that is the bridge that has to be inserted there. Right. So, okay. So let's get to the written word here. Uh, 
I know that you know you've written about this also. You've spoken about this also that uh, you have an abiding and deep interest in the revival of classics, and and you also think that there are multiple stages through which a child can be taken, uh, and those classics to be introduced, and then gradually, uh, if you will, uh, increase the degree of difficulty until the child reaches an age. Uh, where he or she can actually read the classic itself, but by then there are lots of these bridges that she has crossed. So, uh, given your experience, uh, tell my viewers how that works, and because you have actually worked on that yourself. Yes, uh, thank you. So it works like this: that you the first um, stage is a picture book. And in the picture book, um, it is for very young kids. Uh, most of the time, a picture book is narrated aloud to kids by the parents or the guardians or whoever is uh, in the family. Or a child is left alone to explore the book, you know, try to see if he or she can understand any words and uh, make sense of the pictures and the secrets of events through that. So at that first stage through the picture book, the basic um, a story of a classic like Dastan Emir Hamza or Talis Meho Shriba or Busa Nekhal or any of these wonderful Prasad and Dastan that we have is introduced in a 32, 24 page format. So the child is, on, is familiar with that book by the time he or she has finished reading it, with that story by the time she or he is finished uh, reading that. At the next stage, when the child goes to a middle school or say, you know, higher primary, grade five, you introduce a chapter book in which the same story is encountered with a few more characters, a few more details. And since the child already knows the how the story is formed, how it's fashioned, and they are learning new things about it, the interest is there. From that point, we move to the actual classic, like we have uh, sh uh, annotated texts of Shakespeare in uh, grade um, O and um, at O and A levels. So we we never stop to think that this language, which is centuries old, is easy for our kids to understand because it's being provided there in an annotated format. So if we have already two exposures to the picture book and the chapter book. At the third level, they already know the story, but now we are um, giving them the full text, the complete narrative with in a kind of helpful format, which helps them understand the meaning of difficult words. And through these three exposures, a child becomes fully versed in that or in that you know, body of work. So this is how I learned, not that I had a picture book and a chapter book and a, a complete text like that, but I I started early. Um, I, I read widely and then I found, I still remember, an edition of Bao Bahar published by Ghulam Ali and Sons, which was in parts annotated. And I credit that book for helping me understand um, language at a higher level, because that really bridged Many, uh, many things for me. Okay, so we can, yeah, so, so just one thing. So, yeah, can do sure. it with the body of the present dastans, or we can just focus on one big, huge dastan like the Tilisme Hoshoba. And if we just, you know, introduce that through these stages, we can at least have a child reading classical language in no time. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm going to come to that, but let me just try and open it up a little. So, in, in Western literature, and I'm using it loosely, uh, I'd include the Latin American literature also, literature in, in various languages, um, in the, shall I say, the Occident. Uh, and we know uh, magical realism, we've got Marquez, Borges, you know, Nabokov talked about it, lots of other writers. And we also know that it kind of links up. Uh, to a seminal text that was created in our part of the world, Alf Lala Valela. And I just want to get a sense of how 
we have moved from that great creativity and 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 pluralism and and nuances to the kind of literalist dryness that has taken hold of our societies uh, in in the 20th and 21st centuries uh, as a writer as a translator as uh, as someone who has a deep interest in in the classics give me your own sense of why that has happened and how that can be reversed um ajal i think it started uh, there could have been other contributing reasons as well but mainly it was the work of uh, people trying to do good for their people uh, people like sir sayed ahmed khan people like altaf hussain khali who thought that by um by studying um english language or by studying the modern literature um uh, we can we can become uh at the same level we can come at the same we will arrive at the same level as the british uh, who was the colonial power um after that there was the progressive writers movement which did the most damage to our classical literature by openly criticizing its themes its uh, its subject matter and they were the ones who were actually literalist uh, this literalism that you speak of hmm. came from there that you know we we want realism we want something that uh, is natural uh, hali quote continuously talked about naturalism um, and then this this other the generation that came after them it started speaking of reality and you know being influenced by russian writers who are wonderful writers um, and you know revolutionary literature and all that that's that all has its place in a in a people's lives but you cannot just discard your classical literature which has shaped you which has uh, which is the source of all the genres that you you can explore in your own language and which has experiments uh, um, literary experiments hidden in it which you have not bothered to explore uh, but you continuously move towards the latest trend or the latest fashion and i fear that uh, the latest focus on stem education um is also contributing to this move away from literature and just a very sharp focus on uh, mathematics and physics and other um sciences which we think can transform the lives of our children without an equal part um contribution from from the literary side or from you know the their their understanding of literature okay so since you mentioned stem and you know while you dropped out from the electrical engineering side of things the fact is that you you have a stem background yourself and and stem is obviously very important i mean when i talk to uh, mathematicians they talk about the elegance of the mathematical language and the rest of it but my point is slightly different i mean i believe and i've seen you know in my father's generation uh, regardless of whether they were lawyers or army officers or civil servants or there was a you know or let me put it like this uh, for an educated person it was somewhat taken for granted that he or she will have some taste for literature for music for poetry um and regardless of their their actual vocation in life which which may not be uh you know uh, grounded in literature so and and given the fact that it sort of draws on uh your imagination and and serves as a sort of how should i put it it's like calisthenics uh it it it, gi- it gives your mind a certain suppleness uh and so if you take a gymnast and put her into any other sport uh she will probably be better than others who would first need to get the kind of flexibility and so so literature in many ways allows you to connect those dots even when you're doing for instance international relations or political science or history or any of the other social sciences so i i think at some point there's need and not necessarily in a formal setting perhaps but 
in creating an environment at home or at school where the child actually begins to love this. I mean, she can do something completely different. I mean, she can become a physicist or a, and, you know, I mean, uh, there are a number of scientists and philosophers who were deeply immersed in literature. So that, that's, that's actually a fact. Absolutely. So um, two things. Um, uh, there's an Italian classical novel, uh, The Leopard by Lampedusa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they show in that the mayor of the town rising and the count's forge, uh, found fortunes dwindling. But the mayor, when he's rising in, the, in his society or he's, when he's trying to rise in the society, he's aspiring to the higher rewards training his kids in music, in dancing, talking about literature and all that. So the higher rewards in a society are always uh, um, intangible in, in that sense. Yeah. Uh, so um, there's that. And this, um, by, by saying that the focus, uh, STEM is taking away the focus from other things, all I need to say, um, all I mean is that uh, STEM is wonderful and, uh, you know, um, it really opens up uh, your mind to the possibilities of the universe, of, of metaphysics and, you know, uh, so many other things. Um, is that we should be balanced in our approach, especially dealing with kids, um, because that, that segment of our society has to be really, you know, carefully catered to, whether it's education or uh, social laws or the kind of uh, entertainment we produce for them or the kind of literature we write for them. So this is, uh, this is the only uh, submission that I have, that if, if our children are allowed time to explore literature, as, as you mentioned, in an informal setting maybe, maybe as, uh, as an after-school book club or as an after-school storytelling club, where they train, like they train for so many other things, in debates and, you know, uh, table tennis or tennis or whatever. Uh, they train as storytellers. They become immersed with the stories and then they can grow up and do whatever the hell they want <laughs> with their lives and, you know, yeah. be anything. They Absolutely. I mean, there is also, you know, in a different kind of way, but narrative and storytelling also uh, is deeply linked uh, with how a society and state actually exercises power. And in, in, the, in the political and in the economic uh, uh, realms. And we have seen this. I mean, you know, it's a counterfactual. But assuming that instead of the British having colonized the subcontinent, the subcontinent had colonized the British island, uh, where would you then place the luminaries, classic, classical luminaries of Urdu literature. You know, so there is also a certain degree of uh, connection between your military prowess and economic clout with how, you know, you project the literature. I mean, English has become a lingua franca, uh, not for any other reason, but for uh, the, the British colonialism. So I think it can be assailed, uh, you know, in terms of uh, sort of, you know, interpreting it or, or uh, analyzing it. It can be assailed from, from multiple uh, uh, angles. But as someone who is, is watching very closely uh, his own granddaughter, uh, uh, you know, you can see that the child has imagination. The children also... Uh, either talk to each other or when they are alone, they, they, they are talking to themselves, maybe to their guardian angels. Uh, they're playing with their toys. They're probably talking to their toys. And I think all of that has to do with imagination. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but I believe that th that is something uh, which is very important for the child's, uh, you know, uh, evolution uh, in, a, in, a, in a completely informal uh, setting. Absolutely. Um, one of the fun experiments we we did was uh, ask the children after this was a further project, who would they like to hear stories from? Their teachers, 
um, us who are outsiders, you know, a team of storytellers, or their own uh, their own classmates. So guess what they said? <laughs> I think so, they must have said from their classmates. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it was like a 95 or 98 percent kids saying we want to uh, listen to our uh, other kids because we had asked other kids to come and you know do storytelling in front of their class and made them part of the process. So they had a lot of fun and they they can take the kind of lessons with them which they cannot with their teacher or you know an outsider. So it's it's a lot of fun for them. Right. So you developed this Hijay game. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, how does this really help the children? Uh, is it uh, simply for them to understand the 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 alphabet and how there's the connection and how it makes a word, or is it something more than that? It is. Um, it is a. Uh, it is a component that will be used for many things. So, for example, there will be. It will have um, a role in understanding um, language or vocabulary uh, for their own grades. So we are developing a graded vocabulary for a graded vocabulary program, which will be separate from the main Hijay, but operating on the same principles for Hijay.com. Uh, we are going to link it to the Pakistan Spelling Bee project, uh, which will be launched in September and October this year. Uh, which will be done both in English and Urdu languages. So mm -hmm. that will be that will uh, have a role for the Hijay game. Uh, this will be a component of that. Right. And in purpose for uh, designing this, um, in which I had technical help uh, from my friend Avas Athar, was to help kids interact with Urdu text on a daily basis. Okay. So that this distance that, OK, no, it's difficult or I have to hold a pen or, you know, do something. I don't know how the words are joined together is removed and they can just interact with it in a fun uh, setting. And if they don't uh, make a word, that's fine. They can at least, you know, enjoy playing with it or exploring words or making words which they don't even know existed uh, and linked with the dictionary. They can see what it what it means. So this was this was the purpose to you know, bring Urdu uh, in a gamified language, um, language uh, access gamified, let's put it this way. Right. So a number of people say that Urdu is now a laggard uh, in terms of, uh, you know, its inability to, because it hasn't evolved in a certain way. So uh, you don't have uh, scientific and other terms in Urdu. And you have to rely on English for that. Uh, I won't get your sense of whether you agree with that argument. I mean, I have a sense that you probably <laughs> disagree with that. But, but uh, you know, is it is it possible for Urdu, assuming, like Turkish, for instance, if we had decided that this is the language we're going to work in and through, uh, is this language ready for uh, bearing that kind of weight? It absolutely is, Ajaz. And um, a lot of work in creating scientific and uh, technical vocabulary has already been done through uh, by generations of uh, scholars, uh, linguists, uh, lexicographers. Uh, a lot of the time people um, talk about Urdu without much knowledge of the of the kind of work that has been done in Urdu before, so the, these kind of comments say, okay, you know, it cannot. Uh, there's no scientific vocabulary, vocabulary. There's no technical vocabulary. There's no legal vocabulary. So how are we going to use that language? All that vocabulary exists. I have those books in in this very room, and uh, it's just a matter of policy. If a policy is made and um, but not followed then it's good as not having a policy at all. We have seen it in so many things. Uh, new laws come up every day. I remember in Lahore, this law about plastic bags. Uh, it was implemented for maybe two days. And after that, everybody went on to uh, using plastic bags uh, all over again. So it's just a matter of a bit of seriousness, you know, having maybe a 10 year plan. 
and accepting that during this 10 year, we are going to have challenges, but we are going to move in this direction and devote some resources to it and follow it uh, seriously. Without that, without the seriousness of purpose and um, continuity of policy, it is not going to happen. So two quick questions. One with reference to your role as a translator. Uh, now, as you know, uh, there are like basically two schools of thought. Uh, one is about relatively literalist translation of a text. The other is uh, more idiomatic translation of the text. Like, you know, people saying that when you read Omar Khayyam in English, it's more about Fitzgerald than Omar Khayyam. So as a translator yourself, uh, which side do you lean on? In translating classics, I adhere very closely to the written text. Okay. Um, and uh, But at the same time, I respect Fitzgerald's work. Uh, he uh, he never like professed that you know this is the ultimate translation. He created something, correct, um, or you know a literary work in itself. Um, a lot of the time, when people say this cannot be done, or you know this has to be done in a particular way for it to make sense, um, this kind of talk comes from an inability uh, to express yourself uh, in in at a certain in a certain sophisticated idiom which is required for that translation. So either you work on your ability to translate or, uh, or you know, just don't make random mm -hmm. <laughs> comments about uh, right. whether so, or not a thing is. So you, you've translated Dastan uh, and the original text uh, has a number of linguistic sort of nuances, tarakib and, you know, uh, uh, words with, where you can have more than one meaning uh, textually and contextually. So it must have been obviously uh, a very, uh, very tedious process of uh, finding the right words in English. And I, and I know, uh, having, having read your translation, that you've, you know, sort of stuck close to, uh, and in that you have also used English words that are frankly uh, not usually a part of the normal vocabulary. So give us a sense of that, that experience and why you chose the Dastan. It's just, I never thought that the Dastan had not been translated. So when I started looking for an original translation of the Dastan, I was very surprised that it was not uh, some a basic text like that, just so which was patronized by the courts. So Akbar was a fan, mm. and throughout the Mughal Empire, it was a fundamental. It was a very important central text. Um, then we have this history in the subcontinent uh, after the Mughals, when the when the storytellers. And the Dastan goes and started creating uh, more and more volumes of Dastan in Vihan with list of Shiva. So I was sure that there's going to be a good translation available for me to read and uh, enjoy it in, in English again. But um, unfortunately, there was not. Um, so I had to uh, I had to make a decision whether I'm I going to, whether I'm going to translate it or just let it go and you know just sit idle. Um, and I thought that I would do it. Uh, and it has taught me such a lot about language, about the use of language, about the, and it has changed the direction of my own fiction, the, the fiction that I write. Now, now other kind of things interest me uh, with, with more fantastic elements. I read, I had to read so much history just to get the correct meaning or sense in which a particular phrase or um, an item of, clothing, for example, was used. So uh, it has really changed um, changed my concept of what literature is. And I don't think I'd be, uh, I'd be as um, engaged with these kind of themes in my literature today, um, were it not for the exposure to Dastan and my work on translating it. Right. So before I close the program, Musharraf, is there anything else that you think is important enough that we might have sort of, you know, uh, ignored or escaped uh, my questioning to you uh, 
or anything else that you would like to talk about with reference to your own work? Um, I will just say that uh, if we, uh, I'd like to revisit this whole idea of storytelling and uh, uh, orally and as a communication exercise between kids. Uh, I think it is very important and there are models for doing that, which are not expensive at all, uh, which are not uh, one tenth as expensive as the kind of ad tech solutions that uh, people seem to uh, mm. subscribe to all the time without, uh, without an issue. So it's just a matter of deciding whether this thing is important or not. And uh, I'm a big believer in producing beautiful books for kids. But as a child, when I was reading books, it did not matter to me the kind of paper it was printed in. I just wanted to consume the text and right. the story, and you know. So um, good solutions for providing stories to our kids at a very small cost are available. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a great thing, could be a great thing for our kids to have that. Right. And one final quick question. I see, you know, I mean, I see it in your work also, the work that you're doing with children. Uh, you, it seems to me that you are, you, you firmly believe that at the formative stage of a child's life, that's where you have to intervene. And I, for want of a better word, I'm not talking about intervention in a, in a regimented or coercive manner, but just, just simply facilitation. Uh, if you will, uh, am I am I correct in assuming that? Absolutely. If if we if we miss those formative years uh, between three to eight years of age, uh, it would become very very difficult for a child to uh, connect with the stories after that age. Connect with the stories. That's really great. I was uh, reading years ago, uh, as I am now fond of saying, you know, a century ago. Uh, I came across these lines in the prelude, the 1805 text by Wordsworth, where he says, I mean to speak of this interminable building reared by observation of affinities in objects where no brotherhood exists to common minds. And that reminded me of Ghalib's Katre Me Dajla Dikhai Na De Or Juz Me Kul Khel Ladkon Ka Hwa Dida Hai Bina Na Hwa. And that's the, I think, that I see in your work. I mean, as I said earlier, imagination, the ability to connect dots. And as I said in my opening, uh, how can education impart knowledge? And I think that is the kind of criticality that, that uh, uh, you know, imagination helps us create. But I'm really grateful to you, Musharraf, uh, for taking time out and speaking with, with us. And I think uh, it's really important, the work that you're That's doing. Fine. And, and as they say, more power to your, your elbow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This is all for this episode of In Focus with Ajaz Heather. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. Do like and subscribe to the Sesper channel. It helps us to bring quality discussions to you. Take care and goodbye.